Hi, everyone. We are the good doctors of Abbey Research. I am Dr. Kristen. I'm Dr. Aaron. And you are exceptionally welcome to our channel. We are PhDs in social science who are also empathy educators and vaguely obsessed with the idea that people knowing each other better can change the world. We do this work through our YouTube channel and a whole lot of other places. For instance, we have conversations about culture because we're largely obsessed with that too, both popped and lived. We'll go from everything from Bridgerton and the way it talks about female pleasure and racism to conversations about what's happening in the news at the moment we're recording it. This video is part of our Colonizers World Tour series. We are into chapter two, chapter one, places that had never been colonized, <laughs> short chapter. Mm -hmm. Chapter two, this weird kind of quasi state of colonization. And today we are talking about Afghanistan. Our Colonizers World Tour series is about framing uh, an exploration of a culture to look at their history and their development, how they relate to colonialism and the rest of the world. So Aaron, before we started this, oh Lord, what did you know about Afghanistan? What did I know about Afghanistan? Um, not a whole lot, folks. Um, I totally forgot that Charlie Wilson's war was about Afghanistan until you mentioned it. And then I was like, oh, vaguely, I remember Tom Hanks. Um, I have I read- Julia Roberts in the bathtub doing diplomacy and thinking someday I wanna be enough of a badass that I can change the world from my bathtub. From my bathtub. <laughs> Um, so perhaps I should revisit Charlie Wilson's war after this exploration of Afghanistan. Um, I read The Kite Runner, and that was a very um, impactful book. And I remember how I felt reading it the first time and how much it changed and humanized for me um, what happened in Afghanistan. The movie was phenomenal. Um, the follow-up book, A Thousand Splendid Sons, also phenomenal. Uh, but about like the history and kind of, you know, I knew what the Taliban was. I knew what the war on terror was from the United States perspective. Um, the history and culture of Afghanistan outside of conflict, I knew very little. How about yourself? I knew it was a really terrible place for women. <laughs> yeah. And absolutely nothing that I've learned since then has changed that opinion or factual statements. There's even a link in our Google resource doc called we are handcuffed here or something along those lines like yeah life for women's not great yeah I had friends who served in Afghanistan in the whatever operation it was called so I knew their stories um and I watched all the movies and I a lot of them I mean I think like I feel like in the 2000s the only thing we got was white people in sand and fatigues like that was what was at the box office pretty much so yeah. like I saw all of those what was the, was the Hurt Locker Afghanistan? I can't remember. Or Iraq, I can't remember. And here's the thing is, I think legitimately our culture treats them as entirely interchangeable. Yeah, I think that's more to the point than like anything else, is that we can't tell. Like, was it in Kabul or was it in Baghdad? Like, was it against Saddam Hussein or was it against Al-Qaeda? Like, it's, yeah. Oh, they're interchangeable. They're interchangeable. American culture. Ooh, ooh they're not. Wait, they're not, but I'll repent of that belief right now. And still in my head, I don't know where Restrepo took place, but I know I watched it. Yeah. Um, and so I, I knew kind of, I knew there was a lot of caves because Iron Man is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> um, yes. Then, oh, yes, I did. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Tony Stark gets kidnapped demonstrating his Jericho mission, Jericho missile system. Yeah. In Afghanistan. Um, uh, the Hurt Locker was Iraq, just for. Good to know. Um, but yeah. And then what I learned from Charlie Wilson's war, which is if we had just fecking built schools in 1988, a lot of this might have been different. So I, I knew kind of all of that. I had some assumptions like that the people themselves probably didn't like Al Qaeda all that much. They didn't seem particularly great. Didn't like the Taliban. They didn't seem like a great system to live under. Mm -hmm. My guess is that people who were, I guessed that people who were very, very devout Muslims didn't appreciate the, ta the Taliban interpretation of Islam. Right. Um, but I hadn't really ever given it a whole lot of brain space before this week. And I'm glad I did because honestly it confirmed a lot. Mm -hmm. 
and it made it a richer understanding. So let's just really quick run through some demographics um, yeah. before we kind of get into anything else. So, because honestly, the spoiler alert is a lot of what you have heard about Afghanistan is kind of true, but it's richer and deeper than you could have imagined. Yeah. So there's 32 million people that live there. The capital is Kabul. Um, the language is essentially a dialect of Persian. A lot of people do speak Farsi, but really what it is is Dari. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like the officials may speak some level of Arabic or Farsi occasionally, but really what they speak is Dari Persian. And I think there might be like the, the written language might be more Arabic because there's Arabic on the Afghani flag. Yes. So like this might be like the overplay between like what, what Islam is written in and like what language that is. So that was unclear to me, but yes, the spoken language is related to Persian. Is related to Persian because ethnic ethnically, most Afghanis are more ethnically linked to Persians than Arabs. Yes. Um, they are 49% of them are in a tribe and ethnic group called Pashtun. Um, and it kind of goes down from there. I'll say too about the language. I checked seven different sites and got four different definitions on what their language is. So not not sure. They're landlocked, which Dr. Aaron's gonna get into in a little bit more. In terms of like demographics and everything else, I mean, it is what you've heard. Um, yeah. A lot of the men were killed in various wars and conflicts and yet women have very limited power. Mm -hmm. So it's a very stymied nation in that way. In terms of uh, our queer family, it is all queer activity is completely illegal. And the punishment is execution for activity. I don't, I would imagine the punishment is not execution for thoughts because that's very hard to prosecute. But the 70% of the country that's currently um, occupied by the Taliban, my guess is the Taliban does not really care. Nope. Um, so it's not, it's just not a great place. In terms of colonization, it was a British protectorate until 1919. And then it went through one of the longest lists of names <laughs> I've ever seen. So many lists. Just really quick. It was the Kingdom of Afghanistan. Then it was the Republic of Afghanistan. Then it was the communist ruled Soviet backed thing of Afghanistan. Then it was the Islamic State. Then it was the Islamic Emirate. Then it's now the Islamic Republic. Uh huh. So lots of lots and lots of names as they're grappling with their identity. Um, but yeah, like we said before, everything you kind of heard is true because they haven't been able to rule themselves or been left alone for around 300 years. Which is, I think, you know, as we are using colonialism as this lens to, to learn about different places and cultures, it's so interesting to me how our understandings of that as to like academics and humans has evolved, even yeah. in these like six weeks we've been doing it, which I love. If you don't know already anything about Dr. Kristen and I, we like learning. Um, we like being challenged uh, to think about things differently. And, you know, we've looked at these quasi uh, weird relationships with colonial entities like Saudi Arabia, um, and it's the influence of the United States and the UK because of all the oil um, and Iran and like it was never colonized, but it was taken over a lot because it was in this strategic location and Afghanistan is very similar. And shout out to our friends at Geography Now. I'm saying friends, we don't know them, but all of our friends are friends on YouTube um, for making this video and explaining like the geography, the physical geography of uh, Afghanistan and there's you know always a huge connection between physical geography and political geography right I have friends that are political geographists that are like yay Aaron thanks um, but basically Afghanistan as it exists now is shaped by the British colonizing of the Indian subcontinent so India and into what is now Pakistan um, and that's kind of where you get this this bit of uh, Afghanistan, and then the Russians coming down through all of the other stands, pushing to create the boundaries. Uh, and literally, like, there's this tiny bit of land, like this tiny little panhandle at the top of Afghanistan that is just hilariously designated because the British stopped at one line and the Russians stopped at another line, and they were like, oh, we'll give this land to the Afghani people. Um, including a 20 mile strip of border with 
China, which is exceptionally strategic and politically relevant, obviously, because it's a border, a land border with China. So I think like, you know, were they colonized technically? They've been invaded a lot. They've been bandied around. Um, from a couple of the videos we watched, there's not been a whole lot of consideration for what the Afghani people want in about three, three, four hundred years, really, when you're looking at these at these global world powers of the British and the Russians vying for land across the European and Asian continents. Um, and I think that's such an important thing to remember. Yeah. I think our history of Afghanistan is so tied to the last 40, 50 years and our understanding collectively. Um, but, you know, everything has precedent before that. Like, we didn't wake up in 1979 and go, oh, we should be concerned about Afghanistan because it's the Cold War and the Soviet Union just invaded. Like, no. We've always been concerned about those places for lots of reasons um, and been involved in them. And U.S. involvement in Afghanistan goes goes way, way back, way, way back before 9-11 um, and before we decided to be the, you know, to, to intervene and to involve ourselves in that way. So I think for me, like, yeah, there were things I, I learned certainly, um, and we'll get to those in a minute, but I think that's one of the more important lessons that was solidified with this idea. And like, certainly as we go throughout this year, we're gonna get a lot more stark examples of colonial interference. Um, but you know we can we can see the seeds of that even if we aren't going to technically call that land colonized yeah and i mean then the other conversation is what is the difference between colonization and like a terrorist takeover because like the yeah. the taliban is not wanted there by nearly everybody's measurements um and isis is not wanted where it is by a lot of people's measurements in terms of proportion of the population in the same way that like there are always people local people that like the colonizer because of whatever it promises them yeah but the large proportion of folks may not or or whatever there's a lot of those complications and i just think a lot we watched a video that's linked in the documentary of a of a swedish american based traveler who spends 96 hours in afghanistan and it's a emotionally complicated video for us for a whole host of reasons but one of the things I appreciate about it was that he spends time actually talking to an Afghani local mm -hmm. who explains that the worst fate would be the Taliban to take over again yeah and that's a complication we don't hear I don't know about y'all but I don't feel like we hear about Afghanistan at all anymore because we're too busy talking about other things and yet there are still troops there there are still American soldiers on the ground and from the a little bit of research I've done, there's a, at least a proportion of Afghanis that do not want them to leave. And there's a proportion of Afghanis that do want them to leave. But at no point in time in the process of America leaving Afghanistan, does it appear we asked the Afghan people what they would prefer us to do. And so it's, it's all very, I think more than anything, I don't, I learned maybe some facts, but for me, what I take away from this is the drilling down and the deep reminder that people should have permission over who shows up on their land. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I second that. Um, and as we're doing these, like it's, it's one thing to learn specific experiences. Like I knew life was, was not great to really horrible for women there now. Uh, falling under the horrible, under the Taliban controlled parts, but you know, a couple of resources that we've shared in our in our list talk about even the Afghani government is, uh, you know, at times um, passively or actively unhelpful um, for women. So I learned some specifics about that. Self-immolation, where you light yourself on fire, is a particular means of uh, protest out of desperation. For Afghani women, which I did not know specifically, like, so, and there, are, there's importance from learning specifics, from humanizing experiences, um, but I think much bigger generalizations, like general understandings from our time with, with Afghanistan, 
Uh, and for me, the thing that was beautifully done about that video, we talked about the 96 hours in Afghanistan. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to go leave this video without saying my major criticism is at no point do I, any of those men talk about women or what life is like for women in Afghanistan, nor do they talk to a woman in Afghanistan. And maybe they couldn't for cultural reasons, for gender segregated reasons, but they didn't talk about it either. And that's a huge failing. Um, we got a lot out of that video and it humanized Afghani people in a way similar to, um, the video that we shared from Rick Steves. But for me, the thing that I took away from that was the intergenerational trauma of 40, 50 years of ongoing significant conflict. Um, and, the, and the personal relations that we get of, the, of that trauma from their guide, Noor, um, who reminds me, uh, of some friends that I have in Northern Ireland who, you know, there are people who have lived through to, through that kind of trauma of conflict who don't want to talk about it. There are people who find catharsis in sharing their stories and talking about it. Um, and Dr. Kristen and I both know people like that in Northern Ireland on both sides and all sides of that spectrum. But Noor reminded me of some of my friends. He clearly, it's important for him as a human to talk about what he went through. Um, I think that's an important thing to remember. Like not everybody wants to tell you their story. So you don't, as, as the person who wants to go and learn in these places, you don't just get to walk up and say like, tell me about your life. I want to learn about humans. That's a lovely position to be in, but they don't owe you your story, their story. Um, but I think for me, that's, that's what hit really heavily was the, the human cost of conflict is so far beyond just numbers of, of uh, dead and injured bodies. Um, and you get a sense of that in this video, but you also get a sense of uh, like, even in conflict areas, people love their country and they, they just wanna live in their country peacefully. And that is another lesson that we got from our work in Northern Ireland. The majority of people in Northern Ireland just love that plot of land and want it to be peaceful and safe. And I think that's what we can say about the majority of Afghani people as well. Um, and yeah, those were the more serious things that I took. Um, and I certainly will take with me as we venture into our next conflict zone. <laughs> We've got one more video here in this one, which is another example of unflinching and raw exposure to the humans of Afghanistan under the Taliban. It's a movie called Osama, which is the story of a young girl um, and her life under the Taliban. It was the very first movie produced in Afghanistan after the Taliban fell. Um, and it was done in 2004, which it's important to remember that the Taliban did fall. It's just growing again. Yeah. Um, it, the control was wrenched away, but um, there's, the last 20 years have been really complicated. Mm. But we'll see you tomorrow for Osama. And I'll tell you right now, this one screwed us up something, something fierce. Um, and it's, it's a required, but not happy watch. So we hope you'll join us then. Bye. See you then.